Eagles Entertainment. With the 10th pick in the 2021 NFL Draft, the Philadelphia Eagles select... You're listening to the Journey to the Draft podcast. Welcome to the Journey to the Draft podcast presented by Life Friend. I'm your host, Fran Duffy, and we are taking our next step into the pre-draft process in preparation for the 2022 NFL Draft today. And we're going to start things off with Mr. Relevant, where the great Kevin Nagandi from ESPN returns to the show to talk about his biggest takeaways from not just the national title game, but the entire college football season as a whole college football over. We don't have any more college games here for this 2021 season, which is a little bit of a bummer, but we've got, we're going to continue bringing you all the best analysis from everybody across the industry. And we're going to continue doing that here today with Kevin. After that, we're going to break down a mock draft and Saturday scouting with Ben Fennel. That's always going to be a fun exercise. We'll be doing that on a weekly basis here on the show. And then also we've got our results from our pick six segment, our weekly competition between myself and Ross Tucker. I'll hit on that at the end of the show. As always, I want to let you guys know, head on over to Apple Podcasts, leave us a rating, leave us a review. If you've got a question, if you've got a mock draft you want us to break down, if you've got rankings, if you want us to compare certain players, if you want us to reveal our notes on certain players, that is the best way to reach us. Head on over to Apple Podcasts or Stitcher or Spotify, wherever you listen, and you can leave that rating. Leave the comment. I will promise you that it will end up here on an upcoming show. And we're going to continue to ramp that up here as the draft comes closer and closer. We'll be doing the mailbags each and every episode here on the Journey of the Draft podcast. That said, uh, let's get things started. I was really fired up to catch up with Kevin Nagandi from ESPN. He joins us this week for Mr. Relevant. It's time for Mr. Relevant. Excited to welcome in this week for Mr. Relevant, one Kevin Nagani. He's been on the show many times before uh, from ESPN. Does an outstanding job, obviously, covering college football, covering all sports uh, up at the Worldwide Leader. Kevin, thanks so much for joining us here on the show. Grant, my pleasure, man. Big fan of what you do, so uh, happy to be a part of this. I appreciate it, man. I, obviously, uh, you, like I said, have done such a great job of uh, covering college football all throughout the season. And it uh, comes to an end uh, here this week with Georgia getting the national title win. Just the, your big takeaway, one big player that stood out to you uh, in that title win for Georgia over Alabama. You know, there's so many that when you look around, right, um, I, I can go with a lot of layers here because, uh, I mean, Will Anderson is – I mean, if he could enter the draft, he'd be the number one pick, right? And so we're talking about a guy that would be the number one pick in the 2022 draft, but has to wait a year. We've seen that before with Devion Clowney in, in, in previous years and, and other guys that, that have sat out. And, and, you know, Jamar Chase, Micah Parsons, look what they've done, who've sat right. out. And Will Anderson's just one of those special dudes. When you're in the same sentence with Derek Thomas at Alabama, and we know what Derek Thomas did uh, as a college kid, and then what he did as, as a pro, the late great uh, Hall of Famer, I, I just think his energy is incredible. And so we'll have to wait another year. Bryce Young, I think, is special, just what he does. And he's never, he's never rattled despite, uh, you know, um, you know, I think some, some tough, tough throws that he had to make losing out on Jamison Williams, who, who's a guy now that has to deal with an ACL injury. The guy for me, I mean, with all the things I just said, that, and we're talking about this specific draft coming up, I, I got to go to Georgia's defense and to Kobe Dean. And I know the value of linebackers is different with every single organization in this uh, modern NFL, but Nicobe Dean is such a smart type of player as well. We got, we're talking about a guy who's a 4.0 GPA. He his energy, his passion. He's all over the field. He's got the instincts. I, I love the young man. Um, I, there's no doubt. He'll be a top 20 pick. Uh, I saw Daniel Jeremiah compare him to uh, Jonathan Velma. And, and when I saw that, I was like, that is a very, very good comparison. And Velma had a phenomenal NFL career. So uh, right now, if we're talking about specific impact in the upcoming draft, I would say N'Kobe D. And I thought that there was a, a that great sequence. We talked about it earlier this week uh, on the podcast that uh, I thought Fowler and Herb Street did a great job of pointing out on the broadcast with N'Kobe Dean uh, and uh, Channing Tindall uh, down on the yep. goal line and uh, him getting into Tindall a little bit after what looks like a miscommunication and coverage. And then very next play, you see Tindall uh, come up and the first guy to dap him up leaving the field uh, was N'Kobe Dean. So just kind of showing the, the intangibles that he brings to the discussion as well. He's a leader, right? Every defense needs a quarterback and you point to one guy who's going to carry us. He's that type of guy. Very much like 
uh, you know, Willis was with the uh, 49ers. You know, I like the guy that I know no matter what. I mean, we can make a comparison to our, our fan base here. Jeremiah Trotter, when it, when it comes to leadership, who's the guy that's calling everybody out on that second line at the linebacker position? And you brought up Bryce Young as well and talked about his poise. And it's so funny. Like you talk about the, the culture with both of these programs. And honestly, that, that Tyndall and Nicobe Dean situation, that dynamic, you could see that culture on display with what the Bulldogs have. But I think when you look at Bryce Young, you look at Jalen Hurts and Tua and, and Mac Jones, all those guys are just straight line, like very level-headed poise. It just kind of speaks to uh, the type of players Alabama recruits and uh, the way that they find the, the, the things that they value most at that position. Excellent point, Fran. He, and we're talking about a young man who's a, who's a redshirt freshman, right? Okay. Um, yep. what, what, when, when I watched Bryce all season, I thought of Jalen Hurts on numerous occasions because Jalen Hurts, I've said this when the night he was drafted, he is Nick Saban as a player. He's, right. he's never high, never low, always middle. You have no idea if he threw a touchdown. You have no idea if he threw a pick, which is perfect for a quarterback in today's NFL, considering the emotional highs and lows everybody goes through. And, and that is exactly who Bryce Young is. And then you talk about the talent, the arm strength, and a couple of his throws that were pretty incredible. I, I, the, the sky's the limit for that young man. And um, I, I just find it fascinating on what, what Saban has done the last – Eight years. I mean, you could even say six years because, uh, you know, off that Jacob Coker uh, national title in 2015, where it was just like, all right, I need a certain quarterback and a quarterback that's going to execute this offense next level. That's going to challenge things and then go through so many different OCs through the years with the turnover rate and still maintaining this. Let's be aggressive. Let's be ahead of the curve. Let's make sure we're not winning nine, six games. I want advanced offenses. And that's one thing that's blown me away with what Alabama has done with all the quarterbacks that they brought in all the OCs and they remain the same personality wise to your point on who they are. Yeah. And you know, I, it kind of goes hand in hand. That was right around the time when they uh, lost to Johnny Manziel. And it was like, when you got into these shootouts, like we have to be ready for those kinds of battles. And they really opened up the offense. And, and to your point, constantly changing offensive coordinators, the philosophy and the culture and the identity has remained the same. And I, I think that's a, a great takeaway um, from what they've built down there in Tuscaloosa. Uh, you mentioned Nicobe Dean as the guy that stood out most to you. Getting back to that Georgia defense. Is there one guy outside of Dean that you would say, Hey, I, I want to take him. I want to pluck him to my, to my, NFL team, regardless of need, you say like, I want this guy for my NFL franchise. Oh man. There's uh, Jordan Davis is, is a mountain of a man. Um, and he, he's a guy that's just going to stuff the line regardless. And, and, and listen, when you look at the, you look at the foundation of what the Eagles are and what they believe in. It, it plays a big role. You got to win in the trenches, right? Offense and defensive line. Trayvon Walker is insanely good. Uh, you know, scene is fantastic. Uh, Ringo, who had the pick, who's just a, only a freshman. It, it's it's pick your poison. When when you're watching that team. You're honestly saying, and I haven't even call, gotten to Kendrick on the other side, the Clemson transfer. Like you're, you're saying all 11, these guys, uh, you know, whether they're going to be first round picks or fifth round picks, they're all playing on Sunday. Right. Uh, we were going to the Michigan game in the same car, Todd McShane and me. And that is the orange bowl featuring Georgia and Michigan. And he was just like, I, I cannot wait to just watch these guys. Because if you're a scout here, you're in heaven with all the NFL talent that was Michigan. And, and they have a, a ton of talent on the defensive side, especially on the front line versus Georgia. Then you throw in Georgia, Alabama. And at one point, somebody asked me, they're like, how do you approach the Eagles draft? I said, you just send all your scouts to this game and you take as many players that are playing in this game because exactly. you know, at least you're going to hit on three or four guys. So I think Kendrick's one of those guys that I would talk about that cornerback position. Um, he has the experience. He has the awareness aside from Nicobe Dean. I love Trayvon Walker. Mm. And, and I think, I think what they could do on the outside, let's not forget about Smith and Davis and Wyatt. Like it, it, it's, 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 um, it's one of those things that 
that we're going to look back kind of like how we look at that, that Miami team in 2001 and say, this team had this, 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 this. It's kind of how we look at the Alabama's teams the last few years, right? Yeah. And how the ones and twos are all going to be on NFL rosters. Well, it goes back to that Nagobi team, uh, Jonathan Vilma uh, comparison. You know, Vilma, obviously a part of those teams. Um, you know, and I think even going like to the 2019 LSU offense, just such a dominant unit uh, and what this Georgia defense did all season long. So much fun to watch. I'm talking about this quarterback class, uh, this group in general, and obviously um, at the the uh, discussion around it right now is that oh it's, it's not a great it's not a great group. Well, there's a bunch of them that everybody's talking about in those first couple of rounds, and to me, at the end of the day. That's a, that's a, a good group. And, and so I'm interested to get your thoughts. Is there one guy that has stood out to you uh, when you, you know, you're watching on Saturdays? Like, man, like, you know, this guy above the rest uh, has really impressed me here in 2021. It's, it's really tough too. And friend, this is, this is, I, you know, I may not answer this question directly because I think in this specific year with this class, if you can get one of these quarterbacks at like 20 pick 20, 25, let's just say like a Lamar Jackson, because you're already going to a good organization that doesn't need a lot of help. If you're trying to pick one of these quarterbacks in this year's class to be a savior, you're not going to get that. I think if you can land a a guy like Matt Corral, and he's the type of guy that I can see in the mid teens uh, on a team that, that, that just missed the playoffs, but it has a lot of other building blocks that plays a big role, right? He's going to the right system. And I like Matt Corral a lot. I love his arm. I love his, he has a a certain moxie about him that I I relate to Joe Burrow. Uh, He's not Joe Burrow, but I relate to personality wise. I also like Malik Willis. I think he's an X factor type of guy that could do a lot of things, but I also think that you cannot pick these kids or these young men and say, they're going to rescue the franchise. Like we would look at Joe Burrow a few years back. There's not a number one quarterback. Hey, this guy, we're going to reach. We're going to go jump in front of everybody. And we want to take him number one. There is not one of those. Can he pick it? Uh, former temple commit, by the way, I love telling that story before, uh, you know, while Matt rule was there and then he went to Pitt, is a really good player. And I could see a a team in the twenties, let's just say Pittsburgh, like the Steelers stealing Kenny Pickett, where a team is already built around him and has a base and a foundation and you move forward. So to me, those are the three guys, Malik Willis, Matt Corral, Kenny Pickett off the top of my head, where I'm like in the first round, if you pick them in the teens or in the twenties, you're probably going to get somebody really good because you have a lot of other things set up around them. If you're in the top 10, you're rebuilding probably new coaching staff, don't have an idea where you're going right now at this moment because you have to fill in a lot of, uh, of holes that could hurt you like a team like the lions and you're picking number two and you have a lot of holes. I don't know if they're, if they're going to be benefited by making a reach. Now, if they pick the one of these quarterbacks early in the second round, great. But then what's this guy going into because they don't have all the parts yet. And I feel, feel like you crystallize that well because, uh, you know, the, all these guys, they're, they're going to have some flaws. That's why they're not that universal top five guy. But that's a, that's okay. And that's why it's like oh, it's not a terrible group because there are plenty of guys that, you know, you, know who, you know who else was seen as flawed? Like Patrick Mahomes was flawed. Deshaun yep. Watson was flawed. Dak Prescott, Russell Wilson, all these guys were flawed. It's about coming in and trying to find – these guys all have talent. But what's, what's the situation like? And I feel like you, you contextualize that uh, perfectly for the listeners. Last question I've got for you, and then we're going to let you go here. Who deserve, deserves more love? You, you're watching college football every single Saturday uh, from noon until 2 a.m. Uh, so you, you get the, the full context of all these guys. But you also see with the NFL draft discussions, some of these guys not talked about as much. Is there one guy you're like, man, I'm surprised you're not hearing more about this player? It's a really good question. I, I think – Oh man. That, that, so I'm going to be really boring. What you're going to hear a lot about is offense and defensive line uh, for this draft. Yep. Um, and, and, and that's okay because that's where you're going to build things. It's not the, the sexy thing. Uh, there's also another uh, intriguing part of this for me. Um, I think running backs in this draft, you can Ooh. find a heck of a ton of value in the second and third round. Yeah. And I'm going to start with Isaiah Spiller at a and M that young man is one of those guys that you can plug and play and you could take him in the second round and you'd be like, go do what you got to do. And by like the third week of the season, everybody's like, Whoa, Isaiah Spiller just had a hundred yards. And then he's like the hottest. He's one of those guys where I'm like, I, you don't, you don't reach for him, 
uh, the way value is with running backs and how they're viewed, but you're going to get a ton of value late in like a first round or early in the second round, or even the middle, like, like a cam acres, right. Where I thought he was fantastic at Florida state and the Rams got to steal where they drafted him. That's kind of how I view specifically the running back position, in this class. No, it's a, a great call. I think when you look, you look at Spiller, even Brian Robinson, we saw the other night, uh, Brees Hall at Iowa State. It's, it's, a, it's a good group of Kyron Williams from Notre Dame. All these guys do some things differently, um, but all of them have a ton of talent. And I feel like we, we are kind of sleeping on this group a little bit. You, you know, and, and they got a little bit of love in, uh, you know, until they faced Alabama. Mm-hmm. But I, I think the secondary, uh, specifically Kobe Bryant and Sauce mm-hmm. Gardner yep. uh, at Cincinnati, I think a team in the late twenties and early thirties will get a steal with sauce Gardner. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I'm looking at the team in Philadelphia. It would be phenomenal to get him. Uh, if, if they can use the third pick and they're holding on to that third pick a, 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 of the first round, when it comes to what he can do and the depth he can bring, I, I love that. Um, so I, I know, I, I know we're going to nerd out a little bit, but like, that's kind of how I, how I view it. I can, I can go on and on about this, but like, I think you could just find some impact players a little bit later that are not sexy. Yep. And then I think about the, the Eagles specifically and, and, and the cornerback position should be a major, major target here, especially, uh, picking later in that first round. Uh, and a lot of options uh, for sure. You highlighted a couple there. Uh, certainly something to watch here as the, the process unfolds. Kevin, thanks so much for joining us here on the Journey of the Draft podcast. Once again, you can follow Kevin on Twitter at Kevin Nagandi. Kevin, thanks so much. We'll talk to you again soon. Brand, my pleasure, man. Thank you very much. Hey, Eagles fans, get ready for the game each Sunday with an exclusive look at Eagles pregame warmups brought to you live each week when you join myself, Amy Campbell, and Eagles insider Dave Spadaro on the kickoff show presented by Exalta. We provide Eagles focus analysis, late breaking news, and the team perspective that you cannot get anywhere else. The kickoff show presented by Exalta can be seen live 50 minutes before kickoff on PhiladelphiaEagles.com, the Eagles mobile app, and the team's social media channels. It's time for Saturday Scouting. All right, time to get into our mock draft roundup here on Saturday Scouting as I welcome in Ben Fennel. And Ben, uh, we've got a fun mock to go through today. Charles McDonald does great work uh, at For the Win. Uh, this was published earlier this week. Obviously, the, the first, uh, what is it, the first 19 picks, first 18 picks uh, set in stone now uh, for this uh, 2022 NFL draft. And so we've got a handful to, to get through. We'll start off uh, the way we normally do, Ben, and, and that's with our most surprising pick in the top 15. I will let you kick things off. Yeah, it's an exciting time. And this is the time to dive into mock drafts, in my opinion, because 18 teams have turned the page to the 2022 NFL draft. 14 teams are in the playoffs right now. So more than half the league are looking to the future. And so why don't we look to the future as a lot of these fan bases are? So Charles does great work and some interesting picks here in the top 15. Thought it was an interesting note. Chris Olave, his receiver won. Obviously, with the recent injury to Jamison Williams, I think the pecking order at receiver is open, se- is open season, Fran. So just talking about the pecking order there, it could be Alave, who he has mocked here 13th overall to the Browns. But my most surprising pick in the top 15, I know I sound a little repetitive because I picked this one a few weeks ago as well, hmm. David Ojabo, yeah. all the way up to 7th overall to the New York Giants. And for a variety of reasons, surprising because I think the Giants have some other needs. In addition to, they just spent some draft capital on guys like Aziz Oljolari. In addition to, I think that's just way too high for David Ojabu. This guy is on a rocket ship right now with his trajectory. And obviously, we all talk about, don't tell me the player he is today. Tell me the player he's going to be in a year, two, three years. That was a moniker you taught me a few years ago. So it's all about projecting forward. David Ajabu has got the tools to keep projecting and keep uh, ascending his game. But seventh overall for a guy that's a little raw, little developmental, still learning the early down techniques and kind of awarenesses of the game, a little rich for my blood. But I am happy to see him after the three mainstays and Carl Aftis, Thibodeau, first overall, Aiden Hutchinson. I don't think Ojabo is going to leapfrog any of those three. You know, we, we had a very similar conversation this week on the Eagle on the Sky podcast in previewing this Eagles-Bucks matchup, talking about Joe Tryon, uh, the rookie who went 32nd overall to the Tampa Bay Bucks out of Washington. And, you know, I think when you looked at Tryon, 
not the same kind of player, not developmental in the same ways that Ojabo is developmental because uh, Tryon was a three down player for the Huskies. Ojabo really up to this point has not been, and Dane had brought up a couple weeks ago, how, you know, you've seen opponents uh, try and take him out of the game by lining up in heavier personnel and run heavy looks. And that's forced Michigan to kind of take him off the field. And so I think that that is important to talk about, but it's like you said, you're betting on the come with David Ojabo, what he can be down the road. Uh, I, I do think if you're going to take a guy that high it's it's a little bit of a tough pill to swallow to say hey early on we're going to use him in spurts he's not going to be an every down player he's going to be more of a rotational guy i do think that that would need to be the case most likely for david ojabo at least based off the the three games that i've studied so far and one other note just to kind of spin this to big picture our good friend and our good friend in the offensive line community brandon thorne does a lot of great work with big duke and he does uh, one of his publications called the true sack rate and he just put out his season end rankings and all his film work. And it's a great perspective. Make sure everybody subscribes and finds that. But what I thought was so interesting, Fran, his top 13 pass rushers all the way to the right of the column. He has round drafted of the 13 top guys. Right. 11 are first round picks. Yep. yep. One is Trey Hendrickson, a third rounder and Shaq Barrett somehow is an undrafted free agent is in the conversation there. What is that telling me? You better spend some high draft capital on pass rushers. Yep. That's where the talent is. That's where the traits are. And inevitably that's where the production lies as well. So I thought that's just a really interesting kind of a snapshot of who's the best pass rushers. Who are the most productive? Who does a Brandon Thorne think is the best yep. and where were those players acquired? 11 of the top 13 first round picks and a lot of them top 10 picks as well. I love that. That's a great takeaway. Uh, to me, the the one surprising selection, uh, and I, I, it's not necessarily surprising, but it's interesting. And that's number one. It's really it's two quarterbacks going in the top ten. Kenny Pickett at six, Matt Corral at nine to Denver. So Kenny Pickett going to Carolina. Well, there have been we've uh, we've kind of uh, connected those dots here on the podcast in the past um, a few weeks, where you talk about Pickett. He committed to Matt Rule, and Rule was a Temple uh, before uh, Pickett eventually signed with Pitt. So there is a little bit of a relationship there. Uh, and then I think when you look at uh, Matt Corral going to Denver, I think just had the two quarterbacks going in the top ten. Um, that's not what is being billed right now, and. Look, I will say this is all blue in the face. I don't. I think that this quarterback class is getting a little bit of a bad rap in terms of being a hey, you know, if you uh, if you need a quarterback, look elsewhere. I don't think that's the case with this class. I do think that there's talent here. I think there are plenty of guys that you want to try and mold and develop. Um, but I think it'll be interesting to see which of these quarterbacks can make that jump. Pickett is going to the Senior Bowl. He's got that opportunity. Uh, we'll see if he can get himself into the top ten. And in this case, uh, number six overall. Yeah, and there's certainly quarterbacks you can win with. They maybe aren't the the truck, you know, that you're going to put the whole team on their back. There may be a more trailers as DJ uh, Daniel Jeremiah has so eloquently put in the way he categorizes quarterbacks, whether you're the truck or the trailer, maybe it's a little bit more of the trailer feel, but you can win with these guys. And what do we just see Monday night, a Stetson Bennett knock off an Alabama crimson tide. I know we're talking Saturdays to Sundays. These are guys you can win with, you know, I don't like calling them the, the game manager or the guys that don't have the tools or the traits. A lot of NFL GMs and coaches are going to look at Kenny Pickett's and Corral's and Malik Willis and say, we can win with these guys. No doubt about it. Yeah, I think it's a, it's going to be a really interesting uh, just look at these quarterbacks and how the, that narrative changes over the next couple of months. All right, let's get to uh, the Eagles picks here. And the first one comes 15th overall. And again, this is locked in. Eagles first pick as we sit here today. 15th overall. This is the pick that came from the Miami Dolphins. And Charles has them taking defensive lineman to Marvin Leal from Texas A&M. Uh, you listen to him as an edge slash defensive lineman. So uh, we talk about that versatility. But here's the blurb here from Charles. To Marvin Leal is a raw player that needs to work on his technique but he has all the tools to be an explosive penetrating defensive lineman depending on how his team wants to deploy him he could play either inside or outside so uh, ben two questions number one interesting to get your thoughts on the pick to marvin leal ending up here in philadelphia and also do you have leal in your edge bucket or is he in your defensive tackle bucket uh the way that you kind of uh lay out those positions he is in my defensive tackle bucket um, but don't get too caught up because Eagles are pretty much a multiple front team under Jonathan Gannon. So any given down, watch the way rookie Milton Williams was used this year. Some games, defensive end, some a three tech, uh, some he's used creatively in some sub packages, same thing with Fletcher Cox and Josh sweat. And a lot of the guys up and down the line of Jonathan Gannon's uh, defensive line room. So don't get caught up too much on where he's going to play. 
just add good football players to your room. And that's the name of the game. So while he isn't a 230 pound speedy edge rusher, that's okay. Because he's a guy that I think looks a lot like Cam Jordan coming out of Cal and the way he's produced with the New Orleans Saints. And uh, I know a variety of different defensive schemes, but Dennis Allen's multiple, multiple front scheme out there. Nobody looks at Cam Jordan and has to figure out, are you a DN, D tackle? Who cares? You're a great defensive lineman. You'll play up and down that line of scrimmage. Some other names I wrote down, Jonathan Allen coming out of Alabama, also kind of a hybrid player, Leonard Williams coming out of UC, uh, yep. USC. So three former first round picks that I think if he lived up to any of those three, uh, we'd be more, more than pleased to walk away with the DeMarvin Lee out there. Um, really good player, strong player. Some of the concerns right now after his 2021 Fran is people feel like he's turning it on and off. Right. So those are always a little bit of risky picks and you can also fall into a really, really good player because that just shows, Hey, when they turn it on and keep it on, maybe their best football is ahead of them. And it's interesting with a guy like Leal. And obviously there are a lot of teams right now that are lining up with multiple fronts. Like you, you talked about uh, with the Eagles, the Eagles are not the only ones doing that. There are a lot of teams all around the league that are really starting to deploy these guys in, in a multitude of techniques up front. And it's interesting that, you know, six, seven years ago, I think he would have been pigeonholed as like, oh, uh, you know, is he a tweener? Maybe he's only a three, four D end. Right. But uh, I think that that, that versatility uh, is really going to help with the Marvin Leal moving into the NFL. And real quick, Fran, before we put this positional kind of hybrid tweener to bed, Trayvon Walker from Georgia, Haskell Garrett, Ohio State, Zachary Carter from Florida. There's a lot of guys in this class that you're trying to figure out where to play them best. And as the NFL is getting more and more multiple fronts, don't worry about where to play them. Just add good football players that are run pass players, three down players to your defensive line room and figure it out from there. And you mentioned Milton Williams was one of those guys a year ago. Uh, let's get to the next pick. The very next pick, 16th overall, this pick coming from the Indianapolis Colts. This one here, center Tyler Linderbaum from Iowa. And here's the blurb from Charles, who says that Jason Kelsey won't be an Eagle forever. Linderbaum's athleticism fits well with what the Eagles are trying to do with Jalen Hurts at quarterback. And so, uh, Ben, my big takeaway here, Lind Linderbaum, is, his placement in mock drafts is going to be interesting. Uh, you know, we've seen him a lot in the top 10, top 12 picks. Lately, I know we did a mock draft last week where I think they, the, uh, whoever it was that I think it was a PFF mock draft uh, had the Eagles taking Linderbaum at like eight or nine. Right. So uh, I think watching how Linderbaum is kind of viewed is going to be interesting as well over these next few months. Yeah. I can't remember. I did the research like two months ago. I think he would be the first center to ever go in the top 10. Yes. I think um, so. yep. And obviously falling into the rarity of just being an interior offensive lineman in the top 10, which we have seen a little bit more of late with, you know, the Quentin Nelsons of the world and even going back to some bus guys like Jonathan Cooper's, you know, there have been some guard centers in the top 10, but it's rare. So Linderbaum being a center in the top 10 was definitely eye opening. I think the middle of the first round is a much more appropriate landing spot, but some people think, Hey, he can slide over to guard. Like we think he'll be, uh, you know, next to Kelsey until he retires and go back to center. So he's a guy that's really strong, really functionally athletic as well in his own game, getting up to the second level and watching him out in the screen game. I think our offensive line room would welcome him with open arms. I just watched his bowl game against Kentucky, I believe. Mm. And he had to battle that big Mark Lawn McCall, McCall, who's yeah, like 360, yeah. who's a house. Really, really fun battles in there. He's a guy that's not afraid to mix it up, maybe even play a little dirty out there, which I think our guys in the offensive line room would welcome, certainly. But uh, Linderbaum, center, guard, wherever you want to play him, good player. And I think the 16th overall is much more appropriate than a top 10 pick. I love it. Well, let's get to the next one here. And this is 19th overall. This is the Eagles pick. Uh, 15, corner... 16, 19. Man, we're going to be busy in the middle. Three in the, three in the top 20, but we'll see. Hopefully <laughs> this Eagles pick is a little bit higher depending on this outcome uh, here Sunday afternoon against the Bucks. Uh, 19th overall, the Eagles in this mock draft taking Auburn corner, Roger McCreary. Here's the blurb from Charles. The Eagles get an athletic corner to play across from Darius Slay with their original first round pick. Ben, uh, I've talked a lot about Roger McCreary on this podcast. I know you have. Dane has, has been very high on him going back to the summer. I really like the way that this kid plays the game uh, and uh, pairing him with Darius Slay. I've talked about what, what is it that makes Darius Slay great? Well, Darius Slay can play press. He can play off. He can play man. He can play all the kinds of zone you want. He'll come up, defend the run. He's really competitive. He's got ball skills. And that's why I look at McCreary and say, yeah, like 
check out, check a bunch of these boxes. Darius Slay was a second round pick, right? So I think when you start looking at uh, Roger McCreary and say, all right, well, does he have the A plus trait that Derek Singley has? Or even when you look at, at, at Andrew Booth, right? Uh, those guys are, are bigger, hulkier quarters. I don't know that McCreary is going to look all that impressive on the hoof, but this guy checks all of these boxes. I, I would love this, uh, this fit. It makes a lot of sense. Yeah, he's been a three-year starter in the SEC, 2,200 snaps played out there, um, and he's been getting better and better each year. I talk about the cornerback spot being a trial by fire, kind of a learn-on-the-job position. He took his lumps in 2019, 2020, and really settled his game this year into his best season. So anytime you're seeing that trajectory of improvement and development, that's what you want to keep stacking and hope he keeps growing into an elite shutdown corner that I've seen some really good press man, seen some good click and close from off, seen some good zone awareness. He's feisty at six foot one ninety. He's competitive at the catch point. He's showing off some ball skills, experience in the SEC. He's going to test really well. I think he's going to have a competitive week down at the senior bowl. If I'm not mistaken, I think he's going to mobile. He is, yep. he's right. I, I, I got, I, to me, he's one of the top three or five players, probably top three. And we went through it the other day, Fran. It's an interesting corner group. It and is. I just mean that because there's some unproven guys from maybe some obscure schools or some guys that are clearly converts to safety. There's some guys that are awkward sizes like Tariq Wolin, who's 6'4", 205, converted receiver. I got news for you. He's going to have some ups and downs down in Mobile. Roger McCreary might have the best week of any defensive back. It might have the best coverage skills of any defensive back, and I think it's going to show right away down there. Yeah, that's the call. I do think that that'll be the case. Uh, let's get into some player fits and team fits that we like. We'll start on the offensive side of the football. Outside of the top 10. So we're going to go outside top 10, those final 22 picks. What is your favorite player team fit on the offensive side of the football? I'll let you go first. Well, I love, love seeing the Pittsburgh Steelers bolster the interior offensive line. Again, they went Kenyon Green last year after revamping across the board. But adding Kenyon Green next to Kendrick Green, I think would be a great combo in there and pave some more lanes for Najee Harris and this future of the Steelers offense. One other one I want to throw in there. Jahan Dotson going to the Tampa Bay Bucks, obviously trying to figure out that kind of middle of the field that slot yep. receiver. Antonio Brown, see ya. Chris Godwin a little injured at the moment. We'll see if Jalen Darden can kind of carve out a role in his second year. But Jahan Dotson falling to a Tampa Bay Bucks team and maybe another year or two with Tom Brady. Oof, it's going to be dangerous. Dotson could end up being the most productive rookie next year based on his landing spot. Ooh, I like that. That's a, that's a, that's a good call. Well, if you, oh. if you end up being the fourth or fifth receiver and end right. up to a back end team, that's a contending team, maybe a Packers, maybe a bucks, maybe a chiefs. Those are pretty good scenarios. Now he may be a little upset that he's the fourth receiver off the board. I got news for you. When you're, you're in the uh, championship game next year or the AFC championship game, those, those tears dry up pretty quick. No doubt. Well, well let's get out uh, to me. I, I'm going to go. You just picked uh, Dotson, who I believe was 32nd, right? Uh, in, in the mock draft, he had the Bucks winning the Super Bowl. Uh, I'm going to go with the team that picks 31, and that's the Tennessee Titans. I love the addition of Trevor Penning here uh, for the Tennessee Titans. Um, look, they're trying to figure out that offensive tackle spot, you know, and they continue to charge forward with a great uh, offensive front in terms of uh, the way they're able to push people off the ball, win in the run game, uh, a really strong offensive attack there. But when you add in a guy like Trevor Penning, remember you had that miss a couple years ago with Isaiah Wilson in the first round. You hoped that he would be your right tackle opposite Taylor Lewan. Trevor Penning has that ability to step in and be that guy, at the, especially at the point of attack. When you look at the, at the run game, uh, I think that that make that he really kind of provides that boost. And not to mention Tennessee, one of those teams, they're not afraid to, to take players from smaller schools. We've seen that over the past. I mean, think about some of the, the, the highest picks and some of their best players, Kevin Byard, middle Tennessee state. They took Corey Davis in the top five from Western Michigan a few years ago, right? right so yeah. this is a team that's willing to take uh, players, talented players from lower levels of competition uh, since John Robinson has been there with the Titans. So yeah, I really they just like took that. Dylan, they took Dylan Radiance from North Dakota state right. last year in the second yep. round. Yep. That's a good call. Uh, so that, that is a team that's not afraid to dip into uh, whether it's group of five or FCS, uh, uh, level of competition. Let's go uh, defensive side. Favorite player team fit on the defensive side outside the top 10. Well, two really quick ones here, both linebackers. I love seeing a Kobe Dean go to the chargers there. Things didn't work out with Kenneth Murray, tons of injuries out there. I think they really need to address that linebacker spot. And it's going to affect not only the D line in front of them, the safeties behind them need a core quarterback of the defense. Nicobe Dean would look great in Brandon Staley's scheme and just staying in the linebacking group. Devin Lloyd to the Bengals. 
you know, it kind of breaks my heart a little bit to not see the Bengals bolster that offensive line immediately with the highest draft capital, but they can certainly use a linebacker as well. A team that's had some injuries on that second level, some young promising guys like Marcus Bailey and Logan Wilson, Akeem Davis Gaither, um, the one kid out there, Jermaine Pratt's playing good ball, but I think they need a little bit more of a mainstay every down quarterback of the defense. That's good in all three phases. Devin Lloyd to Cincy, the Kobe Dean to the Chargers. That leaves those Alabama guys and some of those other Georgia dogs for round two. A uh, really good linebacking group, in my opinion. Uh, well, it's a good call. I will stay on the in the back seven. The Kyir Elam uh, hype train. I think, look, he's in, in, he's pretty consistent in mock drafts. He's usually in that first round of most mock drafts. Um, I don't know that I quite buy into him always being in the first round of mock drafts. I love this fit with him going to Gus Bradley and the Raiders at 23. I think that is a tailor-made system for Kyir Elam to come in and have success. And so if you tell me, hey, the, the Raiders really value Kyir Elam here at number 23, Sign me up. I think that's a great fit. It's an outstanding, uh, you know, just in terms of like the, the size, the ball skills, the ability to play up at the line of scrimmage, try and beat people up. You look at the corners that they've uh, had success with and the guys that Gus Bradley has bought in since he's been there just in this past year. But we know Gus Bradley, what that identity of that defense is. I think Elam fits that scheme like a glove. I love that one. Yeah, I have a really tough time finding kind of landing spots for those back end corners. Uh, and actually just finding landing spots in general, the back end of round one is a lot of teams uh, that are really good contenders, some complete rosters uh, and some teams that made the playoffs that don't have great rosters in my opinion. So the back end of mock drafts are really interesting this year. Tough to figure out. I thought Charles McDonald did a great job. Yeah, it's outstanding work. And you can always check out Charles uh, at four Verts uh, on Twitter. I think this cornerback group, like you mentioned earlier, is just a, it's a really interesting group. Uh, just so many different body types and scheme fits. And uh, to me, you know, you talk about. I just closed the page. Did he have a mod Gardner in the first round? I think, yeah, I believe so. Yes. He, the, 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 the I unfortunately just closed that page there, but yeah, anyway, yeah, yeah, great job. Uh, Sauce Gardner was in there. Um, but yeah, this was a, uh, a really fun mock draft. Ben, we'll be breaking it down. Uh, continue to break stuff down uh, here next week, right here on the journey of the draft podcast presented by life brand. All right. So great stuff there from Ben. And I told you guys at the top of the show that I was going to reveal our results from our weekly pick six segment. And we came into the week. Uh, Ross had a six point lead coming into the national title weekend. And we had that, uh, that game, North Dakota state against Montana state. Ross and I both picked the bison bison uh, ended up winning. So we both got a point there. Ross picked Georgia. So he got a point. Ross took a Brock Bowers touchdown over Jamison Williams. Williams, I think will probably would have reached the end zone had he played a full game, but uh, unfortunately goes down with the torn ACL. So Ross gets the point on the Brock Bowers touchdown. Uh, Will Anderson did have a more productive day than Georgia linebacker Kobe Dean. So I did get a point, but at the end of the day, just not enough. Ross wins by seven points. He hit on a one more upset than I did over the course of the season that gave him an extra three. And then he was just picking at me here and there. Uh, I took the win in year one. He takes the win here this season. Uh, I know Ross very, very excited to, uh, to beat me here in 2021. Best of luck for me uh, moving into 2022. Hope you guys have enjoyed uh, Ross's hits here every single week on the journey to the draft podcast. Now we'll be back next week. We've got a couple of weeks here before all-star game season really kind of kicks into high gear. It's going to start next week. Uh, we'll continue to get you up to date with all the latest underclassmen news, any kind of uh, jet declarations. We're going to get into all that next week with a couple of episodes Week after that is Shrine Bowl. Senior Bowl is the week after that. Combine, just a, a couple of months away. So we're going to continue getting you ready for the 2022 NFL Draft. Make sure you are subscribed right here to the Journey to the Draft podcast presented by Life Brand. When the clock hits all zeros, the game might be over, but the action is not. Join us for the post-game show presented by Rico for instant reaction. Watch live as Coach Nick Sirianni and Eagles players come to the podium and meet with the media. We will make sure you do not miss a word. Myself, Ike Reese, and Gabriella DiGiovanni will also break down the game live at the desk and hear from Eagles insider Dave Spadaro to get his thoughts. The post-game show presented by Rico can be seen on PhiladelphiaEagles.com, the Eagles mobile app, and the team's social media channels.